it fasting means that a person would be fasting from dawn until dusk. And during that time, they would be abstaining from taking any oral intake, whether this is fluids, medication, or indeed food. Now, while this is obligatory for any healthy adult, the regulations of the Islamic religion is it exempts people who are ill. Having said that, the situation that we face frequently is many people want to fast, and perhaps there's a question on who is ill enough to be considered not to fast. Because the reality, as you can see from this data on type 2 diabetes, that at minimum, nearly 46% of people with type 2 diabetes have the intention of fasting. And in many other countries, this is close to almost 100% of people with type 2 diabetes. So clearly, we have a job of trying to assess who is the person who is considered ill enough to advise not to fast. So my first tip is to stratify the risk of fasting. And I'm delighted that we now have this systematic approach to individualize the care through an application. So through the DAR, the Diabetes and Ramadan Academy application, you will be able to see the risk calculator, which is on the bottom of the screen of the application and go through the process. As you can see here, at the bottom of that screen, you will be able to see the risk calculator and be able to advise your person with diabetes as how to fast. This is based on the Diabetes and Ramadan DAR in collaboration with the International Diabetes Federation, latest recommendations published um, two years ago in 2021. So accordingly, you will be able to come with a, a number of categories. Now, many categories are very important to quantify for that risk. The type of diabetes, the duration of diabetes, the frequency, severity, and awareness of hypoglycemia, the level of glycemic control, and of course, the type of therapy that the person is taking, whether it is one that would be considered with high score, or whether people on what I call Ramadan medication friendly, which scores zero. Does the person have macrovascular disease or not? And if they do, is it stable or unstable? Do they have renal impairment or not? Have they encountered recent or distant, maybe diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmosis 8? For pregnancy, we advise any pregnant lady not to fast. At the end of the day, the lady will not be pregnant forever, so she can compensate for these days in later months. However, there are still some who insist on fasting. The self-monitoring of the blood glucose is an integral part of the risk calculation. If a person is taking insulin or perhaps sulfonylurea and they're not testing, then obviously that would add to their risk. The duration of the fast, where Ramadan varies every year by 11 days. Some person might be in the Northern Pole and their hour of fasting would be long while well, another person might be in a place where the hours of fasting are much shorter. It's not just about the hours of fasting, it's also about the duration, the, the intensity of the job of the person do. So am I doing an intensely physical, physically demanding job, or I'm sitting in a nice air-conditioned atmosphere? Am I in the middle of winter with snow, or I'm a nice warm office? Age and frailty are also important factors. If the person, we do not advise looking into just age, but look into the health and the frailty of the individual. And lastly, the individual own experience um, for Brass Ramadan. So if the score is low, then the person have no reason not to fast from a medical basis. If the score is medium between 3.5 to 6, then it is 50-50 option. If they wish to fast, they can do so, and that's advisable, but they need then to follow the instructions 
of an expert in diabetes. But they also have the license not to fast if they wish not to fast. Obviously, if the score is high, they are strongly advised not to fast. And this recommendation is not just about the expert medical opinion, but it is also with the religious recommendations of the religious authorities, such as the Mufti of Egypt, which, who comes from the Al-Azhar University, an institution quite known for its modest approach. So, of course, we need to individualize the risk of hypoglycemia, and that is my second important tip for fasting Ramadan. Hypoglycemia is one of the serious important factors that people can have during the month of Ramadan, and it varies from a person to person. As I mentioned, the awareness of hypoglycemia, the severity and the frequency of hypoglycemia are very important. So think of these factors. Remember one important factor. What we saw in one of the studies is that the people who have hypoglycemia in non-Ramadan months are almost eight times higher of the risk of developing hypoglycemia when they're not eating or drinking. And that was even higher than any other risk parameter. So certainly that person need to be very careful with, advise them perhaps that they are high risk or you need to modify their therapy and obviously all the other factors. As I mentioned, the intensity of physical labor is very important when it comes to hypoglycemia and the duration of fasting is very important. Now, what about comorbidities? We know that diabetes is frequently associated with a number of comorbidities. And it's very important to think of this when you risk quantify your individual with diabetes before the month of Ramadan. Here in this particular study that we did in, in our center, where I currently work in Dubai, we looked into people with chronic kidney disease stage three. They all were, were given what we called optimal care. This, con um, this constituted of giving them Ramadan structured education, supplied each of them with freestyle libra, and also adjusted their medication according to their recommendations, and we were using the best available medication for us. Now, before Ramadan, the frequency of hypoglycemia of zero um, times on the sensor for two weeks in people with CKD and diabetes was 44%. Those who had one to five episodes of hypoglycemia was nearly 39%. And then six, 17 persons or 17% had um, frequent hypos of six to 10 episodes, and none had over 10 episodes during the duration of the sensor. But during Ramadan, the situation was different. Those with zero hypo, CKD stage 3a, they was only 27%. And the proportion of those with one to five episodes increased, and obviously also the proportion of those who had frequent hypos of over 10 episodes. We did not see in our study alteration of the renal function or any acute emer emergencies, but we so increased the frequency of hypoglycemia detected via the sensor with the individual fasting for the month. The same applied for the group of patients from my center as well, that we looked into the same process who had stable coronary artery disease. We did not see hospitalization for hypoglycemia or for any um, cardiac events, but we saw an increased level of symptoms of hypoglycemia. What about those who were in the, um, and this is as, I can, as I'm showing you here, is the non-fasting versus the Ramadan fasting. So the zero percentage of hypos decreased, the one to five increased, and also the over 10 and the five to 10 have increased. So a person with comorbidities and diabetes is more prone to get hypoglycemia if they fast, unless we try to address this um, during the pre-Ramadan assessment. And hence, these people would have a higher score, even if it's stable, they would score two um, and 
any deterioration in EGFR would also score a minimum of two and a maximum of 6.5. Come to another important point, which I have alluded to earlier, which about age. Now, obviously, age is not a fixed issue because we have people who are belonging to the older generation, but they are very physically fit and healthy. Some are less fit, and that obviously varies. When we looked into the categories of those above the age of 65 versus those who are less than 65, in a survey that we've done through 12 different countries that included over 6,000 person, certainly as we get older, we are prone to have more diabetes related complications. As you can see clearly in the graph where the dark blue is those who are above the age of 65 and the lighter blue is those who are below the age of 65. So the duration of diabetes as well was an important factor along with age. So here you see that people who are of older generation um, are likely to have longer duration of fast. And consequently, the decision of not fasting was done or taken by 29% nearly of those of the older generation versus 12% on those who are younger. And that because it was reflected on the admissions to hospital in those who had hypoglycemia. In those who had hypoglycemia, who are above the age of 65, this is those who were below the age of 40, that was nine times higher. Um, and in visiting the, sorry, this is the, the visiting the ER department and the hospital admissions was over down. So overall, when you add both together, it was 11.6 in those who had hypoglycemia and age above 65 versus only 1% for are those who are young below the age of 40 who had hypoglycemia during Ramadan. So consequently, we confirm in the recommendations of Ramadan, the guidelines, that is not just about age, but looking into the health of the individual. And of course, trying to remember, and when you make the assessment, the physical activity of the individual, the SMBG, which is quite important, the ability to take medication and feeding themselves, as well as the general independence. What about adjustment of the medication during Ramadan? And I will split this into um, non-insulin and insulin medication. So of course, nowadays we have plethora of options, an open buffer of options for the treatment of a person with type two diabetes. Metformin, is a very Ramadan friendly drug. It very rarely causes hypoglycemia. If the person is on the extended release formulations, then they can take it in the evening at the time of the evening meal, which we call it iftar. Or um, if they are on multiple um, tablets, then they can split them between the two meals, the iftar and the suhoor, and the suhoor is the early morning dose. Um, if they are on three tablets, they can maybe take two with a bigger meal and one with a smaller meal. Short acting insulin secretor group, they are not very frequently used. However, because of their nature of um, being short acting, their studies show that they are with lower incidence of hypoglycemia in comparison with other sulfonyl areas. We can adjust to those according to the meal size. DP4 inhibitors have been studied in a number of studies, specifically citagliptin or vildagliptin. I'm aware that vildagliptin is not available in USA, but I guess that the studies of either of these two DP4 inhibitors would be generalized to other DP4 inhibitors. DP4 inhibitors do not frequently cause hypoglycemia, and they are um, um, good from the point of postprandial um, glycemic control, and they are weight neutral. So if the person is taking the tablet once daily, then they can take it with the main meal. If they are taking it twice daily, then they can take it with the two meals that are frequently taken during the month of Ramadan. What about sulfonylureas? Well, out of Ramadan, what we saw, saw in this particular study, that hypoglycemia in normal days, perhaps as the people are eating frequently and having snacks, 
rates of hypoglycemia are not very different as alluded here in the dark gray. But during the month of Ramadan, the rates of hypoglycemia on general sulfonylurea increases. Now, not all sulfonylureas are the same. Glyburide, or what we, uh, what as you call it in North America, or glabenclamide, as it's called in other parts of the world, does have higher rates of hypoglycemia. And hence, we try to avoid it during the month of Ramadan and use the newer generation of sulfonylureas, such as glimepride, and we certainly advise of reducing the dose um, if the person have tight glycemic control and being treated with a sulfonylurea. So not all sulfonylureas call the same glyburide or glybenclamide score one point, while glimepride and, gl and repeglinide would score 0 0.5 points. SGL2 inhibitors are now widely used in the treatment of a person with diabetes because of the cardiovascular outcome protection and renal protection and the profile of the drug in general. But we know they can make a person feel a bit more thirsty and can, in theory, cause a bit of dehydration. There's been numerous studies during the last, last six to seven years, and hence the evidence for their safety and suitability during the month of Ramadan has been evolving. And what we say is it is very important to think of these important classes of drugs. Now, if the person is taking it once daily, then they can take it with the main meal. We advise, of course, that the person would be drinking plenty of fluids in the non-fasting hours. Uh, and of course, there is no need to dose adjust because we do not see hypoglycemia in any higher rates during fasting compared to non-fasting in view of the mode of action of the drug. And the studies that were done were mainly done on canagliflozin and dapagliflozin. And recently, there's been studies on empagliflozin, which has not been included in the, in the guidelines yet, as they were done after the guidelines were launched. But of course, as I mentioned, these drugs are important for cardiovascular protection, and we advise using them as per same recommendations of guidelines in non uh, Ramadan and as per the prescribing instructions of each individual drug. What about insulin? Well, of course, insulin by, nature, by, by its pharmacokinetics and dynamics would increase the risk of hypoglycemia in many people treated with insulin. And we have seen this clearly in studies during the month of Ramadan, where the risk of high, hypoglycemia increased with insulin use when a person is fasting. But it's not just about insulin or any insulin, it's about the type of insulin as well. So here is basal versus intensive insulin study that we did in my center, again with the same methodology, optimum care with freestyle, libra, um, Ramadan focused education, and we provided them with the latest basal or intensive insulin that were available. And clearly you can see that a person treated with intensive insulin have longer um, duration of hypoglycemia, have more episodes of hypoglycemia, and have more frequent clinically significant hypoglycemia, similar to what is considered below 50 milligrams per dl. So obviously, this is something that we are familiar with, we understand, and hence, this also is reflected on the recommendations. A person on multiple insulin injection or on an intensive insulin with combination of mixed insulin and longer acting insulin will score higher than a person just on basal insulin. So the dose adjustment is key here. To minimize the problem is you need to advise your person for dose adjustment. Now, if they're taking long acting basal insulin, uh, the ultra long acting such as Degledec or Glargine 300, we do not need to change the timing. But for Glargine 100, NPH or Detemir, we advise taking the injection at Iftar, which is the evening meal, the sunset meal, and reducing the dose by 15 to 30 percent. 
If the person is taking the basal insulin twice daily, then we take the large dose at the iftar, at the evening meal, and we reduce the early morning dose, the suhoor dose, by 50%. For short-acting insulin, obviously this usually matches the carbohydrate intake. So if a person is having two meals, they would have the two injections. For the, in, for the meal that is the suhoor one, the one just before they uh, start the fast, we then advise reducing the dose by 25 to 50%. We frequently see people having, even during fasting, another snack at midnight or close to midnight. And we say that obviously, if they're eating, they, then they need to take short acting insulin that would match the meal carbohydrate content. Premix insulin, um, if they are taking once daily at iftar, then they obviously would take the same dose without reduction. If they are taking twice a day, then the big dose at iftar and the smaller dose at the suhoor or the early morning dose and reduce that by 25 to 50%. If they're taking it three times a day, then they obviously omit the therm injection because we cannot really see that it would be feasible to have three injection within nine um, hours or so, which is usually the maximum duration of eating time during the month of Ramadan. But do not forget with a dose titration that some people are feasting during Ramadan after the long hours of fast. They tend, in many cases, to have food that is rich in carbon sugar. And this graph of the, C of the flash glucose monitor with hyperglycemia from the evening time and throughout the night is not uncommon. So as we are concerned about dose titration to avoid hypoglycemia, we are equally concerned about dose titration for hyperglycemia. So provide your patient with a simple algorithm. The target in Ramadan is slightly more relaxed than the target in normal days. So here our target is five to seven millimoles or 90 to 126 milligrams per DL. And if the person is achieving the target, no need to change. If they are close to the target, higher than um, increased by two units. If they are significantly higher than increased by four units. And here we meant it to be above 11 millimoles or 200 milligrams. Equally, if they are marginally hypo, reduced by two units, significantly hypo, then reduced by four units. We apply this principle in an important study, a randomized control, control trial, comparing IDEC asp with BIASP30, biphasic insulin ASPAR3070. Each of them were given twice daily, and the dose during Ramadan, at the beginning of Ramadan month, was reduced for the early morning meal from 37 units to 21 units. And obviously with titration, um, that remained more or less the same. And first day post-Ramadan, it went up again to more or less the same dose as before Ramadan, while the other injection dose did not change during the month of Ramadan from just pre-Ramadan. And that worked very well and rates of hypoglycemia were lower and efficacy was sustained. So all of this tells me that the most important tip is to empower the person with diabetes for Ramadan with education and ensuring frequent monitoring. The elements of the education would include the risk quantification that we've discussed, the medication adjustment that I've just discussed, but of course, many other aspects such as blood glucose monitoring, fluid and dietary advice, exercise advice and reinforcement of when to break the fast. Education works. And in this particular study that we did in London, in UK, we saw that the person who received education, they reduced their, their risk of hypoglycemia by 44%, while those who did not increased their risk of hypoglycemia by 75%. And indeed, the HB1C 
was sustained in those who received indication while it increased in those who did not uh, have indication. And the effect of this lasted for 12 months from the time of indication. Obviously, many of the aspects of adjustments and diabetes management during Ramadan could be um, very useful for the usual months as well. So the blood glucose monitoring and the dose adjustments come hand in hand. And I've just mentioned and shown you the algorithm that we use for people um, being treated on insulin. We do not advise seven times a day monitoring unless in someone who is on intensive insulin and need that frequent dose adjustment. But we say that these are the seven important times, particularly during the last few hours of the fasting be between afternoon and sunset. And this is the time that people need to check frequently to prevent and detect hypoglycemia. But as I mentioned, do not forget the checking during the eating hours so that we can see the pattern in case someone is overindulging with too much of the sugary and rich food that many people during Ramadan do indeed eat. Breaking the fast when a person is with significant markers such as hypoglycemia is crucial. Some people feel that they have been fasting for long hours and it's only one more hour from the breaking the fast time. So they are reluctant to break the fast. And obviously this could be serious and dangerous. And we've noticed this in a couple of studies that we have seen during the last 10 years or so. So it's very important to reinforce the message to people with diabetes of enforcing must break the fast if their blood glucose level is low, whether they are symptomatic or not. And of course, if they are symptomatic, they should be cautious and break the fast. We also advise breaking the fast if the blood glucose level is suddenly high, um, out of the norm of the individual, as this might be a marker that the person is facing um, maybe a concurrent problem or acute infection or something that would need the person to be a bit more cautious. Many of these aspects of the education are available on the Dar Safa, which is short for safe fasting application. The, the patient education program, the Ramadan nutrition plan, the uh, advice on know what to eat with the various carbs and calories of each meal item, as well as videos on um, from many experts across the globe. And indeed, it comes in various languages, English, Arabic, Urdu, and French. So finally, post-Ramadan assessment is really very important. After Ramadan is over, we need to discuss with a person with diabetes how Ramadan was, whether smooth or bumpy, and reflect on this because obviously this would be very important for the future Ramadan. Of course, after Ramadan comes the feast, which we call Eid al-Fitr, and this usually is three days of like Easter or Christmas and similar to many religious um, um, so, um, festivities, it includes many food that is rich with carbs and sugar and fat. So it's important that the person would be careful and would know what to do. And with this, I thank you all very much. And I hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and looking forward to further um, collaboration. The website of David and Ramadan, as well as the applications, include many information. And my email is there. If you want to um, email me with any questions, I'll be very happy to take to respond to your questions. Thank you all. And I'm thankful for the ADA for giving me this opportunity to discuss with you such an important issue. Thank you.